At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time. But once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion. And if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us so that in the service time when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. My question to you is why do we wait so long to refresh and renew our spirit with God? Why do we wait until we're like this? Or maybe even more specifically, why do we wait for an implosion before we do what everybody around us knew we needed to do, and maybe we even had a little inkling? It's funny, I told you last week that the most common answer is that when you say, how are you, is people say, fine, and you say, how are you, and what are the two top answers? I'm tired and I'm busy. So this week I saw somebody and I said, hey, how are you doing? He said, oh, I'm really tired. And I said, I've heard that. He came back two minutes later, he said, ask me again, I want to try again. <laughs> like, you got me, but... I... And I hope that we begin to have that awareness of what is it that drains us what is it that restores and renews us? And where are we in that level? Because a lot of it is about awareness. And we're going to talk about a famous person from the scriptures, from 1 Kings 19, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory. But this is a guy who waited too long. He didn't stop before he got to the point of collapse. And I want you to see not only what happened to him, but I want you to see how God lovingly and, res and kindly responded to him. So we're talking this week about Elijah. If you go to the Mount Carmel in Israel, there's a statue right here on Mount Carmel because this was the high, big moment of Elijah's life. And God had been using Elijah as a spokesperson in a time when the nation of Israel was really sinful. And so God said, the rain is going to stop. And he used Elijah to stop the rain. And there was a, a war going on, if you will, in the spiritual world between Jehovah God and the god Baal, or Baal, and Asherah. And the story that the people were believing is that Baal and Asherah were somehow the ones who provided the rain and they provided crops and they're the ones who provided the ability to have children. They were, they were the fertility gods. And Ahab the king and his wife Jezebel were leading that charge of worshiping these false gods. And so God said, I'll show you who's in charge and he shut off the water. And so for three years there was no water. And then God said to Elijah, okay, now it's time to come back on the scene and we're going to have a, a showdown at the OK Corral. And so Elijah called for the prophets of Baal to come up to Mount Carmel and he called for the people of Israel to witness and they set up two altars. And the challenge that Elijah set out is we're going to put on stones, we're going to put on wood, we're going to put on a sacrifice and the God that makes fire fall is the real deal. Now, think about this. Elijah was really putting himself out there, right? He was incredibly faith-filled at that moment. And so, what happens is, he says, okay, you guys go first. And so they made their altar, and they were dancing around and praying to their gods and doing whatever rituals they did, and nothing happens, and nothing happens, and nothing happens. And about midday... Elijah gets sarcastic. That's why I know it's a spiritual gift, because here's a man of God. And he says to him, maybe he's on vacation. In fact, I'm not sure about the Hebrew, but I think he also says, maybe he's in the bathroom. And you can imagine how that's going over. And if you think about the picture here, there's 450 guys on this side and one guy on this side, and he's mocking them. And so they start cutting themselves and hoping that the blood running down their legs will make their gods pay attention. And the silence was continual. And so then Elijah said, it's my turn. 
And he not only did the altar and the sacrifice, he said, you know, this isn't good enough. And so he had him pour barrels of water until it filled a trench around the altar. If God's going to show up, let's make sure it's God. Can you imagine that moment? And he starts praying and saying, God, would you show these people that you're real? And fire from heaven falls. And it not only starts the fire on the altar, it blows the altar apart, it licks up all the water. Basically, you got a crater left there. And so in a surge of emotion, the people gathered up and they killed the prophets of Baal. And then Elijah went up on the mountain and he began praying that God would send water, that he would send rain. God, you've proven yourself to be true. And so he prays and nothing, and he prays again, and if you read this, he prays in the seventh time, he sees a little cloud out over the ocean, like, like a hand-sized cloud, and he says, hang on, water's coming, and the rain came. And you would think after a story like that, that he would just be incredibly pumped, that he would think now God has shown himself and the nation of Israel I think he expected an instantaneous revival, that the whole nation would just go, okay, let's burn all the Asherah poles, let's get rid of these gods, let's follow the true God. And evidently, we find later in the story, that's not what happened. And so I want you to read with me, or listen to me read from chapter 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Didn't that sound like a tattletale? And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. I'm going to kill you. And what did you think this great faith-filled prophet did? It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Now understand, this was a credible threat. Jezebel was a mean woman, and she was not above killing people. And so she said, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to bring all the powers of my rule to bear to find you and hunt you down and kill you. He was was afraid. But look at what happened. When he came to Beersheba, that's like 100 miles south in Judah, he left his servant there, notice that, where he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came to a broom bush, and he sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. Wow. He's from this mountaintop experience where God shows up and shows his power and responds to his prayer, and it's like this huge moment. And here he is a few days later, and he's out in the middle of the desert all by himself, He lies down under this bush and he says, God, please kill me. We call this his suicidal moment, right? And I think if you see this story, it's the valley between two mountains in Elijah's life. And I don't know where you are at this point, but from my private conversations with people, I think more people get despondent even to the point of thinking of taking their own life. It happens a lot more than people admit that there are those low moments in your life. And I want you to know that family church isn't okay to not be okay. That there are times when we are struggling and our, in our pride, we often want to try to handle it ourselves. And God wants us to come to Him and He wants us to be there for each other. And there's this moment when Elijah looks at God and he says, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And we were talking about this message, and, and uh, one of the guys on the team said, you know, God answered his prayer when he prayed for no rain, and God answered his prayer when he asked for fire, and God answered his prayer when he asked for rain. Aren't you glad God didn't answer his prayer when he said, kill me? Aren't you glad that God doesn't always answer your prayers? That you're not the one organizing the universe and telling God what to do? That God has a plan And at this moment of despondence, he says, I don't know what I'm going to do. And we're going to skip ahead in the story, but he ends up down at the Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, down in the desert where God had appeared to the Israelites before. 
And there is this moment where he talks to God and he is in this correspondence with God. But in between there, in the middle of the valley, I want you to see that God responds to him gently. Because how you see God when you are in that valley will completely depend, uh, will completely determine whether you can come to him with honesty and with authenticity. Look what happens here. He, he was, in his life, he had gone to this point in the valley because he was too worried. He was a fearful person at this point. Now, I told you that Jezebel was a mean woman, so this is, there's some legitimacy to it, but he had let fear take over his life. He had stood up to 450 prophets of Baal and one woman sent him packing. And he had let that fear get into his head and he was f- afraid. And then, if you notice that as I read through it, it said he got down to Beersheba, which is this town at the very south end of Judah. And it says he left his servant there. He only has one friend left and he dumps him. I don't know how you are, but a lot of people, when they get to a really point, a low point, they start pushing their friends away. They don't respond. They distance themselves. It's part of our self-protective measure. We don't want people to know how bad we are. And because of that, we often alienate and isolate from the very people who might be a part of our recovery, might be a part of our help. And he leaves his buddy there, and he says, I'm going out into the desert. And honestly, this was probably part of his suicide preparations. I don't want to be with anybody when this happens. And then you look at his life, and I think he was just tired. He had not only gone through this incredible emotional experience, and I think it's a great reminder, hard crises drain you. Can good things also drain you? Yeah. You ever planned for a wedding? You know, I try to warn couples when they're getting married. It's like that day you are, at the end of that day, you're going to be more tired than you've probably ever been in your whole life because you're emotionally drained, you're socially drained. It's just, it's beautiful and wonderful, but it's tired. And I wonder if Elijah was not aware that even when he was at this high moment, he was exhausted. And what happens when he gets out in the middle of the desert? He gets under a bush in the desert and he falls asleep. He is exhausted. And then I think there's one more factor in his lack of awareness about where he is, is I think he was deeply disappointed, and I can't point this to you in the text, but when God asks him, what are you doing here, his response is, I alone remain. I am the only one serving you, God. And to me, that says he expected there to be this huge response, and evidently it wasn't there. Because he felt like after all of that, nobody really was following God except he was there by himself. And so God looks at this servant of his, and if you think it, he's kind of pulling a Jonah move, right? God has a plan for him, and what does he do? He's running out in the middle of the desert, now he says, God, kill me. And what does God do? It says, he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. And at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. I think of the tenderness. If if you and I were at that point where we were exhausted and running and pushing people away and asking to die, and then God appears or God sends an angel, I I think the message we would be expecting is, what in the matter is wrong with you? What are you doing here? Why are you running? What's going on? I thought you were going to be my servant. I thought you were my spokesperson. And I find it really sad that sometimes when people are at the lowest moment of their life, they think God is yelling at them. They think God's mad at them or they've somehow disappointed him or they're somehow falling short. Do we all fall short? Yeah. And this was not Elijah's proudest moment. But I want you to see God comes along and and he touched him and he says, get up and eat. Don't you like people that use nice, short conversation words like that? Come on in, let's eat. And then it says, there was bread baked over the coals. Now, if you want to sell your house, bake some bread ahead of time because it's the best air freshener there is. And here's God coming alongside his servant who is a spiritual man, but he's in a human body. 
and he's tired, and he's grouchy, and he's hungry. My mom used to say, we'll all like each other better after we eat. <laughs> and, then he, and then an angel appears to him, and what does he do? <laughs> he rolls over and goes back to sleep, which tells you how exhausted he was. And then the next move, it says, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him. I don't know how long he let him sleep, but he said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. I don't know how you're doing today. I don't know whether you're on a mountaintop or if you're out in the desert in the low place. But I believe God's answer, God's message to us is the journey is too much for you. You see, we would love to see God use us. We'd love to be in God's place where we can be generous to others and we would love to be letting God work in us and through us. But the truth is that sometimes we are all in and we're done. And God comes along and he says, the journey's too much for you. And the beautiful part of that message is I'm here with you because it's too much for you. And then it says, so he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. It's an interesting side note that it's only about 200 or maybe 250 miles from where Elijah was to Mount Sinai. And it took him 40 days to make what could have been a 15-day or 20-day trip. And I don't know if that's because he was wandering in the desert. I don't know if it's because he was just still exhausted. But it took him 40 days. But where he finally ended up was where all Israel looked at. This is the mountain of God. This is where God appeared to Moses. This is where the Ten Commandments were given. If there's no place else to find God, this is the place to find Him. And at the end of the story, in the middle of his despondency, Elijah goes to meet with God. And you know, God is patient with us, but God also wants to dialogue with us. God wants that honesty that comes as we speak to him. And so God works with us, I believe, to help us be humble and authentic in our response so that we will respond to God with honesty. I don't know how you do when you're praying. I don't know if you tell God what you think he wants to hear or if you really tell him what's going on. You see, I, pr I think prayer is one of the tools for our awareness. As you're praying to God, you can do some of that inventory that says, how am I doing? Am I waiting too long to get help? Am I waiting too long to go to God? Am I waiting too long to get rested? Do I just keep pushing and pushing because I think I can handle this myself? Or do I come to God and do I honestly say, God, here's what I need, here's where I am, here's what's going on with me? It says, he goes down to Mount Horeb, and it says, he went into the cave, and he spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? What's going on with you? And Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars, and they've put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountains in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. I don't know about you, but I would have been a little worried about that point. You remember the whole fire falling earlier? You remember he knew God was a good shot? And in the middle of that, he's honest with God. God says, what are you doing here? And he's like, he, <laughs> I think he goes off on the rant that he's been saying in his own head for the last 40 days. They're trying to kill the, they killed all the prophets, now they're trying to kill me, there's nobody left. He was having a major pity party. And I like the fact that he's honest with God, that he just tells it how it is. And I like the fact that God can handle it. But then God also says, I want to show you some things. I want to speak to you right here. And I've got a friend who's been struggling with this whole idea of rest and waiting, and Pastor Will agreed to share a little bit of his story, and so we're going to watch a video, and I want you to see what God is doing in him and through him. So this is a very relevant topic for you. Um, you've been sharing a little bit with me how you're kind of wrestling with this whole thing. You might, you mind sharing with us 
just what's going on? Yeah, when, when we talk about rest and the idea of taking time and restoring what's inside of you, I've come to the realization I have no idea how to do that. Um, and it's probably something I have to be even more aware of. It's something that I know my father and my grandfather, who were both pastors, struggled mightily with. Uh, it really came, I became aware of it, really aware, um, three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago on a Monday, I was taking my day off, and I had a little I- idea of the checklist of what I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to go and buy some 4x4 four four posts because I was rebuilding a swing for uh, the yard, and I wanted to get that, just get the, the, the materials for it. But I started digging, and I got a post done, and then I kept digging, and I kept digging, and I realized at 8.30 that night that the entire thing was done, and I was exhausted. Huh. And uh, it was my day off, and I thought about going to work the next day, and I thought about how I had nothing in the tank. And that's something that normally kind of restores you, working in the yard, and that's something you do. But I'm hearing once you start digging, you just keep digging and digging. You get into a hole, and it gets worse and worse. That, that's exactly um, where it felt. I didn't know, and I don't know, really, how to alter that. And this is like, this is a really relevant topic for me because I really am uh, in a place where this is a, an area where I really have to grow um, or crash. Be a, or crash. It's funny, yeah. uh, on that note, I was thinking, I, I wear a Fitbit, which means I watch my steps and I'm pretty active on it and it's not unusual. Especially like if you're going to have a meeting with Will, you walk somewhere. That is true. Uh, but even on my day off when I, I, I keep moving a lot, and I thought, what would it be like if I actually echoed out some of what they did in the Sabbath? Where instead of saying, how many can I get? What if I limited how many steps I would get? And so having a goal instead of to get 20,000. But what would it be like for a day to try and stay under 5,000 steps? Which means I would have to sit in the hammock and just read. And I would have to have the longer conversation and listen deeper and stop moving. Interesting. Switch the goal. That's kind of the Sabbath idea, isn't it? Well, then it puts me in a place where I have to stop doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Because I, ha- I can't keep doing what I'm doing. Something has to change. Well, one of the things I admire about you, Will, is I, I love the fact that you're authentic. You admit, I'm working on this. This is, this is real in my life right now. Um, you shared a couple things that you're trying to do, like especially in the middle of the night when you wake up and your brain just goes off. Can you, can you kind of share that with us? Well, a lot of times what what happens in the middle of the night when I wake up is that um, the actual gifting that God's given me undercuts my ability to rest because I'm Mm. strategic. Actually, um, Zach was praying for me, and he said, God, help him. The gift you've given him is killing him Mm. because I'll wake up, and I'll be thinking, how would we do this, and how would we do this? And I was thinking in the middle of the night, the 23rd Psalm, which says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And I thought about the issue that I was trying to solve which I don't know if you're this way, but at three o'clock in the morning, whatever issue you're trying to solve is always 10 times bigger. And don't, don't you feel kind of smart at that time when you're oh, thinking I'm, about Oh, I'm a genius, but I'm still <laughs> terrified. And so I was actually wrestling with one of those. And uh, I was thinking, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, if the Lord is my shepherd, what would that look like there in that moment? And so I was picturing Jesus, the good shepherd, walking into that space of what I was trying to solve. And as he was solving it for me, he said, I've got this. And it's interesting, that night I didn't actually go back to sleep, but I felt far more peaceful. And then in, in other times I was thinking about, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. W- what does it feel like to say, I can trust him in this, and I can go ahead and relax and, and go back to sleep? So uh, I, I'm really evaluating, how do I live out rest when I'm not when I'm not on, and then in that middle of the night, how do I really put my heart in his hands and say, I trust you right now? Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that, brother. Isn't that good? And some of you need to hear the shepherd saying, I got that. We've talked about praying and let it, leaving it with God. I want to show you a picture that I hope stays in your mind as a visual reminder of what it is that we're wanting to do. What does this page need? <laughs> this is full of a lot of good stuff. What it doesn't have is white space. And you know, they'll tell you graphically, if you put too much on a page, you can't read it. And when you put white space in, listen carefully, it makes the black space more important. In fact, I'll say we need to go this far. 
we need to focus and say, what is the most important part of that? In my time, in my finances, in my energy, in my relationships, that to make a greater accomplishment, you've got to get some white space around it. That's what this series is about. Not just so that we can be a leisurely society, not just so that we can enjoy our life better, but so that we can be more effective to make a difference for God. To believe the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He refreshes my soul, not just to make me happy, but to make me effective for Him. That the purpose of the white space is restoration, and the purpose of the restoration is so that I can be more effective. So instead of waiting too long, let me give you some practical ideas from this chapter about waiting on God. That instead of waiting too long, we need to learn to wait on God. That phrase that you may be familiar with that comes from Isaiah chapter 40 that we're going to end with. But I want you to look at how God reframes Elijah's picture. The Lord said, go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then there's this kind of strange moment. And it says, a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Huge moment of power, but God wasn't working in that. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. You think God's trying to make a point here? I think Elijah had understood that God was powerful. I think that he hadn't understood is that God was also very personal. Look at what the next part is. After the fire came a gentle whisper, and when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out, and he stood in the face of the cave. And a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Maybe God's saying to that to you today. What are you doing here? Where are you in your life? What is it that you're letting just take over your, your fret index? What is it that you're focusing your time and your energy and your money on? I think it's a wonderful ev awareness evaluation to step back and to say, God, what am I doing here? And I think there's a, a way in which Elijah's had his intercom stuck on sand, and he's been talking. In fact, in this place, he goes off and he says to God exactly the same thing he's already said to him, like maybe God had amnesia and he'd forgotten. But then he does something that we need to learn to do, and that is he stopped and he listened. He listened because God's now speaking and God's got his attention and he needs to see God as not only the one who is powerful enough, he needs to see the one that God is the one who cares for him. And so God comes along and he, he gives him a new assignment. And you need not only a better picture of God, we need to see God as all that he is. That part of your reading in the scripture should be, God, let me see a clearer picture of who you are. Because we need reminded. But then we also need a better process of restoring how is it that God takes us from the place that we were in the valley to a place of fruitfulness again? And look what God says to, to Elijah in this moment. He says to him, go back the way you came. God allows U-turns, aren't you glad? Because quite often when we get out to that desert and we're all despondent, he gently responded to his physical needs. He's gently speaking and teaching him. And then he says, get back on the track and go back to the desert of Damascus. And then when you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram and anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. So those two guys were heads of state of the northern kingdom of Israel and of a country called Aram. Nothing to do with his ministry in Judah. But God said, listen, Elijah, I got important stuff for you to do. You're going to be anointing the heads of the nations of these countries. And then he says, and then I want you to go anoint Elisha. Elisha becomes Elijah's sidekick for a number of years. And they work together. And they share life together. And you know, I think a core, Elijah needed to see God better. And then he needed to have somebody in his pocket. Somebody in his corner. Somebody he could care for. And my question to you is, when you get into that valley, when you're at a point maybe where you're even suicidal, who in the world would you tell? Is there anybody you trust enough to let them know when you're not okay? 
And I would hope for you that not only you would have an open prayer life with God, but that you would have an open conduit with a friend. That you could say, I am not doing okay. I need you to pray for me. I need you to come alongside of me. I need to be able to admit to you what's really going on. And God gives him Elisha. And so he comes along and he says, okay, I've heard your pity party. We've restored you. Now let's get back to work. And he lets him do some very important things. And he gives him this sidekick, this friend. And then he says, by the way, your math is bad. I've reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. You said you alone remain? Let me remind you, God always has a bigger plan than you can see. Elijah, you're not the only one. You're not the end. It's not all on you. You're not the only hope. I am. So quit carrying that burden. Quit believing that lie. And let's get back to doing what I want you to do. And you know what? Elijah did it. He got up. He did what God called him to do. And he had a fruitful ministry, and he poured into Elisha, who then impacted the nation for years to come. So what do we learn out of that? We learn that Elijah was really honest with God, and that he went through a really low point in his life that a lot of us do, and that God still has a future for you, he still has a plan, he still has a purpose, if you'll listen, if you'll be aware of what's going on in you, and you let God work in you. So let me give you some specific steps. We need a better process of restoring, and I think some of this we see in Elijah's life, and some of it maybe we've just learned as we restore together. And one of them is we need to learn to go to God in prayer. We need honesty with God, awareness. And then let me challenge you in this week, in your prayer time, would you do something, would you get a little white space in your prayer time? Instead of just walking in with all of your grocery list of needs, why don't you say, God, I'm going to give you a few minutes to talk to me, and then just wait. And sometimes when I do that, God clearly puts things on my heart and mind. Sometimes it's just a time of quietness and rest. But I want you to hear God's voice as a shepherd saying, I got this. And I want you to hear him say, I still have a plan for you. I have some things I want to do in your life. Trust me. And I want for you that you would listen to God and that he would work in you. So there's a spiritual restoration. There's also the fact that we are in human bodies. That you are a spirit, but you have a body. And sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Can I get an amen on that? That's what Sundays are for, right? Sunday afternoon. Sometimes you need to just stop. Like, Pastor Will said, you set a limit of how many steps you're going to have on your Fitbit, and you need to say, okay, I need to stop, I need to rest. There's also something that I find is I ask people the question, and I asked you to wrestle with this. What is it that restores you? Because the answer is not the same for everyone. It always includes spiritual. It has to do often with how you physically handle your life. But I find for a lot of people, one of the answers is, We exercise, we walk as a family, we communicate together. There's something about exercising and especially doing it together that brings up conversations that don't come up otherwise. And if you haven't tried that, that's something maybe you ought to think about. Here, here's how do I get this into my schedule? And think about this, in Bible times, to get anywhere, what did you have to do? Yeah, there used to be a lot more white space naturally in our lives. Meal preparation took longer. Getting anywhere took longer. So there was this space between things. And what we've done now is we've hurried everything up. And what that means is often there's no space. And we don't even know we're exhausted till we collapse. And so that's one of the ways of making space. And then the third thing is I've talked to people about what is it that restores you. There's a theme that comes up regularly And that is something to do with ascetic beauty, either enjoying it or creating it. That God has created us to enjoy beauty. And I, I find a lot of people talk about water, going to the river, going to the ocean, taking some time to just go on a hike. And I believe that God has designed us 
to have a need for that creative energy, that creative enjoyment of beauty. And you know what? That takes time. You don't run through a, an art gallery. You, you enjoy. And I think we have... <laughs> if I was in Nevada, this would be a hard message to give, but you're in Oregon. It's beautiful everywhere. People come here to vacation. And you drive right by it and don't notice. And I think we need to slow down and say, wow, God, you do great things. Have you ever stood at a sunset and clapped? What an awesome show. That was a great end of the day, God. And then there's something within us that, that creative of doing things that make beauty. And I want you to wrestle with this question. Where am I? You know, we've got a physical gauge and a spiritual gauge and an emotional gauge and a relational gauge. And if you've got one of those gauges that's on empty, you need to take some time and restore spiritually and restore physically and restore emotionally, restore relationally. And I want you to ask God for yourself where you are, and then I want you to have Him give you some answers about what it is that He has for you to do. And I believe that when you are restored, then God will say, okay, now let's get on the road again. Because his goal for us is not to be on vacation for our life. His goal is that we be restored and renewed so that we can again pour our life out for the King of Kings. But that's a rhythm, and I will tell you that's the most fulfilling way to live your life. And Elijah is a great picture of a mountaintop to a valley to a mountaintop, and then he was back in the game doing what God called him to do. I'm going to hand off to South County and to Umqua, and I want to just remind you of this verse that you may have heard of. It says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. And then it's focus on God's tirelessness, his power, and his understanding of us. And then it says, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Physical strength goes quickly. But then he says, those who hope in the Lord or who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's God's promise to us, is that if we learn to wait on him instead of waiting too long, that not just our physical energy, but he will give us that reason to go on. And we can, again, step back into what God has called us to do. So my challenge is that you spend some time this week in your quiet time writing down some things that are true about God. Remind yourself that he's a good shepherd, that he's a good father. Remind yourself that he is not only the God of fire, he's the God of the still small voice. And when you make yourself remember that again, when your God gets bigger, then your problems get smaller. And we need that reminder, even if you already know it intellectually. And then I want you to think about how it is that you're going to renew your life this week. How do you get white space into your days? And you know what I always say? Well, maybe next week I'll start that. Same thing we do with a diet, right? But if you're not renewing and restoring right now, then you probably never will. And so I want you to think about where you are, what the gauges are saying, and how it is that you can step into renewal. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home if you're able or wherever you might be. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a uh, loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of, of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is and the, 
And, and it's a spiritual moment that the scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to, to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd, I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong. And he's kind of trying to correct them. And so he brings in some things to, to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to, to remember that what had happened. And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person. So this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread and then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to, to share something as true and to, to again review it and remember that. And so he's saying whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, wow, this is what happened. And, and Jesus' body was broken for me and, and his blood was shed for me. And I am now a part of the family of, of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, so then whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And, he, and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a, a big feast, and, and some people were coming and they were hungry and they were elbowing their way in and they were getting a lot and it, it turned into a, a, a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, but it's also a great reminder for you and I that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says, we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there, is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And, and maybe you think, I, I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin. But you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been misusing the, the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's, that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you. And so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, confess. I, I blow it all the time. I'm, I'm a sinful person. And thank you, God, for forgiving me. And, and, and you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and, and kind of like clear the plate. And I, I think it's impor important for us to do that daily, but it seems like when we celebrate communion, there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying, okay, I want to clear my heart. And then, and then he says, we are to remember the body and blood of Christ. And I, and I think as you go through and as you take that bread, you, you think about cross. You think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And, and about his body that was, he was whipped and his the crown of thorns. And, and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it, but, but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him. This, this is a free gift for me, but ah, the cost was incredible. And, and, and when you think of the blood and the fact that it was shed for me, that that's the only way that sin is forgiven. And in the Old Testament, it was a lamb that was killed and the, the, the throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar. And that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, 
This is so incredible. And so you take that and and then I encourage you and and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I I remember you, I take this. And you you eat the bread and drink the cup drink from the cup and and let it be a a spiritual moment for you so I'd like to lead you in prayer and um, if if you'd like to spend a few moments after that uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then and then go ahead and eat and and drink whenever you're ready let's pray father I thank you for those who are joining us online and and father all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering and reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and, and saying how grateful we are to you. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this this symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people. In your precious name, amen. Now as the music continues, just go through that process wherever you are in that and we'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today. Thank you.